but I'll, I'll combine two questions because I think they're relevant for what we're doing today. Um, so the next question is um, kind of two part. The first is, do you think there's a difference between teaching live face to face versus teaching virtually? Uh, and then adding on to that, how to engage the audience in virtual meetings when you're teaching mindfulness? Yeah. You know, with virtual, it's it's kind of harder to sense the room, sense into how engaged people are. Um, and so when teaching virtually, I try to en encourage people to use the chat to, you know, encourage a dialogue, um, to let me know what's happening for them if I can't read them very well. Um I try to encourage people in the beginning to share where they're from, why they're here, um, and just try to engage the chat section much more. Um, uh, but, um, and so when I teach on Zoom, I tend to have like the gallery section where I see everyone's face or as many people's face as I can rather than staring at myself or like just mm -hmm. one person. I try to see as many people as possible, which is just helpful for me. Mm -hmm. um, but it can be, it can be challenging. Um, I just, you know, I encourage you to have like a warm cup of mint tea or something that you can clutch or, you know, uh, remember to plant your feet on the ground, sense into your body and do your best at connecting with them with connecting with them at the heart level as much as you can. Um, but some of the principles are the same. Yeah, that, that resonates a lot. And I think, um, yeah, we've been experiencing exactly that. We're trying to deliver you know, impactful teachings and mindfulness virtually. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so Skylar Ong, uh, asks, can you share more about how you build safety for trauma-sensitive mindfulness, please? Especially since the visceral sensations may be very difficult to accept for traumatized individuals. I know that's, that's a, a lot big, there. Yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a big question, but I think it's important to actually care about them and to express that care in a very sincere way, not to come off as being too dry or you know, uh, clinical, but really come across from the, from the heart, letting them know you care, um, giving people the option to not do anything that makes them feel uncomfortable, giving people options to leave the room, um, raise their hand and say, look, this is too much, or just bow out of a meditation and just you know, find their happy place or like find a practice that does work for them. Um, it can be helpful in the beginning to identify areas of safety um, in the body or um, thoughts of safety or to invite the um, support of other people, either by kind of bringing them to the top of mind or, um, you know, to work with um, allowing the good in to your mind, into your body, like receiving care, receiving um, respect, receiving um, worth from the outside and allowing that in, or there's different ways of, of uh, giving people options and, and establishing safety in that way. But that's not an exhaustive list, and I do want to refer people to Trauma Sensitive Mindfulness by David Trelevin for more of an exhaustive approach. Awesome. And yeah, Sandra's got the link to that book that we'll include uh, in the chat just in a few minutes uh, and when we get closer to wrapping up. Um, so thank you for that. Um, a question from Leah Singer. She says, my purpose in life is to take mindfulness out to the community. How would you introduce practices you teach to someone who would never do a yoga class, listen to talks, or do something similar like this? Yeah, you know, um, you don't have to call it mindfulness. You don't have to call it meditation. 
Some people will call it, you know, mental strength training or embodied resilience methods or emotional intelligence instruction. So you can name it different things. Um, and you can ask them what their goals are. And what do you want? You want peak performance? Do you want more calm? Um, you know, what do you not want? What do you want to change? Um, and work with those things, work with their goals and their challenges and say, great, I have a eight week program for you that will help you with that. And even if their motives aren't necessarily wholesome or spiritual, the teachings are the same. <laughs> you can still get them to, or you can still encourage them to notice their moment to moment experience without judgment and work with things like resilience and emotional regulation and calming practices and self-compassion and all these things. Um, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, I, I don't have the exact quote, but he said, you know, it kind of doesn't matter what the motives are for pursuing mindfulness because mindfulness will end up changing you for the, for the, for the better. That's, that's a very butchered quote, but, oh. um, but I will work with people based on their goals and their motives and kind of use the same teachings regardless. Nice. Yeah, I think that's, I've experienced that too, really needing to shift the language. Um, even I, I teach yoga and I've called it, you know, just stretching or really simplify it to, to make it accessible. Right. Um, we've got time for uh, just a couple more. Um, let's go with Amy P's question. Uh, would you recommend anything in place of retreats or for deepening your practice, particularly nowadays, I think you touched on this a bit in your uh, in your talk. Yeah, um, you know, I think home retreats, like I said, are very powerful, or they can be very powerful. Um, there's actually a few online mindfulness retreats being offered by places like Spirit Rock and um, different places, so you can find sort of guided home retreats. Um, you know, but I think besides a retreat, just lengthening your practice, seeing if you can, um, sit for five minutes more than you normally would, or, um, listen to some guided meditations that maybe you normally wouldn't listen to, um, sort of within this framework of, of categories of, heart cultivation or concentration, you know, concentration practices fuel our ability to stay mindful. Uh, Heart-centered practices help us to judge less. And so these constellations of practices can help us strengthen our mindfulness. Um, you know, uh, mindfulness of eating, I found is very mm. powerful. Anything that we ingest really from chocolate to bourbon to uh, kale, media. yeah. Um, whatever we ingest, just noticing, being curious about um, our bodies um, and how we actually feel before we ingest what we ingest without judgment noticing what we ingest during or how it feels as we ingest and noticing how our bodies feel afterwards just to notice. So there's no like judgment here, but just being very curious about the actual sensations of your experience before, during and after anything you eat or drink. Um, that can be very powerful, um, but also mindful movements, you know, yoga, stretching, qigong, whatever it is, walking um, to your car, um, walking to the bathroom, you know, that can be sort of a uh, incognito practice at the office of mindful walking to the bathroom or from the bathroom. Um, 
you know, starting meetings uh, with mindfulness of centering, grounding, heart opening, wishing people well. Um, there's all sorts of incognito practices like that we can do at work. Um, and just kind of keep finding ways to keep noticing more and more aspects of your experience and integrating it into more of your daily life. Because it's not just for the cushion, as we know, it's really for all of our life. And so as mindfulness teachers, can we keep exploring more facets of our own life, more facets of others? Um, and, 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 and Yeah, go ahead. Sean, yeah, again, I, we're, we're about to wrap up, um, but I wanted to plug again your website, mindfulnessexercises.com, where you have thousands of resources for free. So for the folks who are curious about how to take this to your workplace, into schools, into your community, um, these are all amazing resources. Um, and then, Sean, what's a good way to engage with you outside of the conference? Yeah, so uh, you can email me at uh, Sean. That's S-E-A-N at mindfulnessexercises.com. Or um, if you're interested in uh, becoming a, a certified mindfulness meditation teacher, um, you can book a free 15-minute call with me to see if my program is right for you. And you can find that uh, scheduling link at teach.mindfulnessexercises.com. Um, but I'd be happy to help people with their practice and with sharing mindfulness with others because um, the world could use it right now. Truly. And we're fortunate we have amazing sessions coming up on this channel. Uh, if your time zone allows for it, we have Zen meditation and an introduction to transcendental meditation coming up next. Um, if you loved what you heard here today from Sean, of course, you can uh, purchase the all access to the content from this conference and from all the thousands of sessions that are happening. There's so much goodness. And I know there's a lot of amazing offers right now for how to get access to that. Um, also, if you are a therapist or um, in, in the world of healing, um, there's some other really good promotions and discounts for you to be able to get access again. Um, again, Sean, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Sandra for our host. Uh, thank you to our engaged attendees who have been active in the chat. Um, we, we listed a lot of the links that we mentioned in the chat. If you want to uh, individually copy and paste those into your own document, you can. Um, you can also click the three dots near the chat uh, and save the chat to your own machine. Um, so with that said, we're going to wrap up. Sean, back to you for one final piece of wisdom or advice around embodiment and teaching mindfulness. What do you want to leave the listeners with? Yeah. Um, to keep um, being courageous in what you open to, what you can notice being courageous to not judge and to sort of soften the judgments and replace it with curiosity and openness and kindness. Beautiful. Thank you so much for having me.